Isaiah 53.1, the Zeroah is Yeshua, who has believed our report, and to whom is the Zeroah of the Lord revealed. Now, following the ten plagues, the children of Israel left Egypt. We can see this in Exodus chapter 12, verse 29 through 31. It came to pass that at midnight, well, midnight is going to be a prophetic allusion to the time of great darkness of the tribulation period called the Great Tribulation. At midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn. And Pharaoh rose up, and he called for Moses and Aaron by night, and said, Go serve the Lord. And this is prophetic, that when Babylon is judged, Zion, or Jacob, is redeemed. Isaiah 13, it says the burden of Babylon. It says they will come from a far country against Babylon to destroy the whole land. And it says it will never be inhabited. So once we have the judgment upon Babylon, and, and I have a separate teaching on this, that I believe that particular prophecy is referring to a judgment that comes upon the United States of America. And the judgment is because they've been leading the effort to bring about the Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. So there's going to be a judgment for that. And, it, and in judging Babylon, it says, the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and set them in their own land. So from the judgment or following the judgment or in the midst of the judgment, of Babylon, he's redeeming Jacob. We can see this in Isaiah 48. It says, Hear this, O house of Jacob. He will do his pleasure on Babylon, judging Babylon. Now he's telling his people who's living in Babylon, Flee Babylon with a voice of singing and say this, when you're fleeing Babylon, say this, The Lord has redeemed Jacob. We see this in Jeremiah 50. The word that Lord spoke against Babylon, there comes up a nation against her, and I'm going to punish the king of Babylon, and I will bring Israel again to his habitation. I will punish the king of Babylon, I will bring Israel again to his habitation. Jeremiah 50, the word that the Lord spoke against Babylon, there will come up a nation against her, none will dwell therein. In those days and at that time, which is an idiomatic expression for the day of the Lord or the end of days. So this is a prophecy about the end of days. The children of Israel will come, they and the children of Judah together. Where? From Babylon. And they will ask the way to Zion. As Babylon is being judged, his people are being delivered out of it. Jeremiah 51. I will raise up against Babylon a destroying wind... And you that escape the sword, that escape the judgment, let Jerusalem come to your mind. Leave. Return to Jerusalem. Now, in the book by Rabbi Menachem Schneerson in the Garden of Torah, we've been seeing many examples of this, that the way in which he delivered his people historically out of Egypt is... Are, is prophetic of how he would deliver his people from worldwide captivity. The exodus from Egypt is connected to the ultimate redemption. We can see the principle stated in Hosea 2 verse 15. It says, I will give her her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor for door hope. Now the word Achor in Hebrew means trouble. So you can say the valley of trouble, the valley of trouble, the valley of trouble is a door of hope. Well what's the valley of trouble a reference to? Jacob's trouble, the tribulation. So the tribulation is a time of hope. The tribulation is a time of hope. Why? Because she will sing there as in the days of her youth. She will sing as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Yes. Micah 7 verse 15. According to the days of your coming out of the land of Egypt, according to those days, will I in the future showing marvelous things. So, in reference to Micah 7, verse 15, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson comments, 
This means that the future redemption, the end of the exile, is a parallel of what happened when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 22, it says, The Lord showed signs and wonders upon Egypt. So look, they left Egypt. They went through the wilderness. They left Egypt. They went through the wilderness on their way to their promised land. That's a prophecy. He brought us out from there. They left Egypt that he might bring us in to go to the promised land. And in getting to the promised land, he's going to give us the land that he promised to the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when they left Egypt, they didn't just go to the promised land. The destination was a specific place in the promised land. They left Egypt to go specifically to Jerusalem. Now, if you can see that the goal of leaving Egypt was not just to get into the promised land, but to arrive in Jerusalem, that they actually did not complete that physical journey mm -hmm. until the days of David. Mm -hmm. Because it was only under King David were the people in the land, mm -hmm. and as a united twelve tribes, did they have a king that ruled over them from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. That was the goal. So here in 2 Samuel 5.1, all the tribes of Israel came to David, and all the elders of Israel then ultimately anoint David king over Israel. And David took the stronghold of Zion, which is called the city of David. So now, in speaking about the exile, in the end of the exile, it says in Jeremiah 3 verse 14, Turn, O backsliding children, says the Lord, I'm married to you. I will take you one of the city to a family, and I will bring you to Zion. I'm married to you. I'm going to take you from exile to Zion. I'm married. I'm going to take you from exile to Zion. So the bringing of Zion, the, re the end result, is a marriage. Yes. Jeremiah 3.18 In those days the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel. They will come together out of the land of the, of the north to the land that I gave for an inheritance to their fathers. The end of the exile is the twelve tribes united. So in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 23, he brought us out that he might bring us in to give us the land he swore to our fathers. That the ending of the exile, we're going to be journeying to the promised land, going, going through the wilderness... But the end destination is the end of the exile. And the end of the exile is the Messianic era. Now in Isaiah 2, 2 and 3, it says, In the last days the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. And many people will go and say, Come, let's go to the mountain of the Lord. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, exile is a consequence of breaking the covenant. Deuteronomy chapter 28, 15 and 64. It will come to pass, if you will not listen to the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments, that the Lord will scatter you among all people from one end of the earth to the other. And the promise that was given in Deuteronomy 30 is even though his people broke the covenant and went into exile, they'll be regathered. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 1, it will come to pass when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse, that you will return unto the Lord your God and you will obey his voice according to all, all that I command you this day. They return to the Torah. In exile, they return to the Torah. That then the Lord your God will turn your captivity and have compassion upon you and gather you from all nations. The promise of the God of Israel is to gather the exiles of Israel. And if any of you be driven out from the outermost parts of heaven, from there will he gather you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed. 
he will multiply you above your fathers. So this is describing Deuteronomy 31 through 5 is a return from worldwide captivity to return and you'll have it better than your fathers. That's the Messianic era. Now the exile itself is likened to a wound. Deuteronomy 32, 15. Jezerun waxed fat because he forsook God. He forsook the rock of his salvation. Who's the rock of our salvation? Yeshua. So that's a prophecy that the one that made covenant with the house of Jacob at Mount Sinai, that's Yeshua. They would forsake him. Who's the rock of his salvation? They would forsake Yeshua. And they would provoke him to jealousy by serving strange gods. And he would scatter them. And he would, the exile, he would wound them. But it says in Deuteronomy 32, 20, 39, I wound, but also I heal. Mm. <coughs> we can see how the exile is likened to a wound. Lamentations chapter 2, <coughs> verse 13. O daughter of Jerusalem, virgin daughter of Zion, who can heal you? Jeremiah chapter 30, 12 and 13. Your bruise is incurable. Your wound is grievous. And verse 13, there are no healing medicines. In other words, you can't go to any gods and solve your problem. Hosea 5 verse 13, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrians, yet could he not heal you nor cure you of your wound? So, the end of the exile is the healing of the wound. Jeremiah 3, verse 20. As a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel. So, return, backsliding children. I will heal you of your backslidings. Verse 17. I will restore health to you. I will heal you of your wound. Mm. Now, because they called you an outcast, saying this is Zion, which no man seeks after. Oh, um, you believe in following Torah? You believe that this is a, a land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? We don't believe that. That's radical right-wing extremists. That's not ever going to bring peace to the world. When they call you an outcast, then I'm going to deliver you. Now, one of the commandments of the Torah is to remember the historical Egyptian redemption. Exodus 13, verse 8, and, and you shall show your son in that day and say, it's being done because of what the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it will be a sign upon your hand and a memorial between your eyes. What is to be a sign upon your hand? And what is to be a memorial? That you're always to remember it. What? that with a strong hand has the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Why does he command that you remember that it was done and how it was done? Because once they break the covenant, he's promised to return them. And how's he going to return them? It will be like he did it. So if you always remember how it was done, then you will understand how it will be done. Mm. This is what Paul was trying to communicate that we are to identify with the coming out of Egypt and giving commandments about Sinai. In 1 Corinthians 10, 1-4, Moreover, brother, I would not that you be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, they all passed to the sea. They were all immersed into Moses in the cloud and the sea. What's that talking about? The coming out of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea. Now, regarding that event, Paul is writing primarily to non-Jewish believers. And he's telling non-Jewish believers, reminding them of the historical Egyptian exodus, and says, don't, don't be ignorant about that, that all our fathers were in the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They all were immersed into Moses. They did all eat the same spiritual meat. They did all drink the same spiritual drink. The rock is Messiah. So he's emphasizing that this happened to all. Mm. But do you realize 
it's not literally true oh. that he was teaching from Deuteronomy 29, 12 to 15 that what was given at Mount Sinai was to those who were there and those who were not there. Not referring to the children of Israel coming out of Egypt to remember that it happened to all of us. He goes on to say about it in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 that what happened to them was written for us. Our admonition, our instruction, our understanding. What happened to them was written for our understanding upon whom the ends of the ages are come, the last generation. It was written so the last generation would understand how the end of the exile would come. Now, here in Psalm 78, we're told that the Torah, or we might say the historical Egyptian redemption, is a parable. God gave it as a parable. Now, he gave it for us as something that literally happened, but what literally happened was a prophecy. What literally happened had a deeper meaning. What literally happened was a parable. So it says in Psalm 78, Give ear, O my people, to my Torah, I will open my mouth in a parable. Give ear to my Torah, I will open my mouth in a parable. And if you read the rest of Psalm 78, it's talking about what happened historically when the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt in their journey um, in the wilderness. So, for example, it says he divided the sea and caused them to pass through. I will open my mouth in a parable, he divided the sea. I will open my mouth in a parable, he divided the sea. That's a parable. So, what we've covered so far is the following principles. The events which happen in the lives of the patriarchs are prophetic of what will happen to their descendants. Biblical history is prophecy. Abraham went to Egypt and Pharaoh took his wife Sarah and later sent her away. The children of Israel went to Egypt, were in bondage to Pharaoh when the God of Israel delivered them. Yeshua remembered his covenant with Abraham and redeemed his people from Egypt. Yeshua will remember his covenant with Abraham and end the exile of the twelve tribes of Israel. Pharaoh sent Sarah away at Passover. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed at Passover. Egypt was judged and the children of Israel was redeemed from Egypt at Passover. A prophecy that the end of the exile begins at Passover. Isaac was born at Passover. Biblical Zion will be born at Passover. Jacob's conflict with Esau is prophetic of the conflict between Jacob and Esau during the tribulation period called Jacob's trouble. Joseph was sold by his brothers. This is prophetic that the nation of Israel would be sold into the nations. Visit is a code word for redemption. Joseph told his brothers that the God of Israel will visit you. Moses told the children of Israel that Yahweh is visiting you. At his first coming, Yeshua visited his people. Yahweh visited Sarah when Isaac was born. The birth of Isaac is prophetic of the birth of biblical Zion. Number 10. Pharaoh is a type of the false messiah and Hasatan, the devil. Number 11. Pharaoh did not know Yahweh. Redemption is knowing Yahweh. Number 12. In Egypt, Pharaoh... No. In Egypt, Yahweh. In Egypt, Yahweh made a distinction between his people and Egypt. Redemption is making a distinction between his people and the beast system. Number 13. The children of Israel were redeemed out of Egypt with signs and wonders. The future redemption will be associated with signs and wonders. Number 14. The children of Israel were redeemed out of Egypt when Yahweh judged Egypt. Yahweh will judge Babylon and the nations when he ends the exile of his people. Number 15, exile was like a wound, and redemption is the healing of the wound. Number 16, the children of Israel were redeemed out of Egypt to go to the promised land. Their specific destination was Jerusalem. In ending the exile, the God of Israel will bring his people to Zion, which is Jerusalem. Number 17, the historical Egyptian redemption is linked with the end of the exile of all 12 tribes. Number 18, the historical Egyptian redemption is a parable. It's a parable to understand the end of the exile of all 12 tribes. Number 19, it's a commandment to remember the historical Egyptian redemption 
so that we can understand the way that the God of Israel and the exile. Number 20. Yeshua delivered his people out of Egypt. Yeshua died on the tree to gather and unite the twelve tribes of Israel. Yeshua will gather his people from the nations of the world and end the exile of the house of Jacob. So that's the foundation, the principles of which we can understand how the exile will take place. But now let's get a little bit more specific applying it to the things that are happening here in our days and our time. And it's prophesied that the nations will create a Palestinian state. They'll do so by dividing the land of Israel in the city of Jerusalem, which will lead to the judgment of the nations. And in the judgment of the nations, you will see the fall of the end-time spiritual land of Babylon. The end-time spiritual land of Babylon, I believe, is the United States of America. And as this judgment is happening in the world, upon the United States as well, then the God of Israel at this time will then call forth and he will gather the exiles of Israel and unite northern kingdom and southern kingdom and the completion of the task is Yeshua setting his feet down to the Mount of Olives and him ruling and reigning in the kingdom. And so a trigger event is the nations declaring a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital and in non-acceptance of this by Bible-believing Jews in the land, and Zechariah 12 called the governors of Judah, that they would declare an independent state in the West Bank with Jerusalem as the capital of the independent state. And the Bible calls this zeal. So the conclusion of what Yahweh is doing is the end result is he's bringing about zeal. Biblical zeal. But what is Biblical Zion? Biblical Zion is the oneness or the unity of the people of the God of Israel who is Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, Ephraim and Judah. It's the unity of His people with the land, inheriting the land promise made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And they are following the Torah of the Messiah with the Messor with the Messiah over them and being their head. The this is the completion of the prophetic plan of God. And so the climax of his redemptive plan is the bringing forth of biblical zeal. Now, if you look at what biblical zeal is, it's the unity of these things. Mm -hmm. So what has been the conflict or the, the, the struggle over the years? Well, it is Hasatan, and he operates through our religious systems. He seeks to divide these things. That you separate Yeshua from his people. Separate Yeshua from the land. Separate Yeshua from the Messiah. In other words, um, a way of trying to bring about the separation is the teaching. If you believe in Yeshua, you don't follow the Torah. For non-Jews, if you believe in Yeshua, no, you don't inherit the land. That's for somebody else. If you believe in Yeshua, no, you're not a part of the 12 tribes of Israel and the redemptive plan to the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's, it's the strategy to keep Messiah separated and those that believe in the Messiah, specifically non-Jews, to keep them separated from the Torah and the land and the people. So then, look, biblical zeal never happens. But then, for the Jewish people who believe in following the Torah, and they claim the land, they say, well, the land's only for us. It's not, it's not for the non-Jew. They don't recognize their brother Joseph. And Yeshua is not the Messiah. And so it's, it's ultimately, when we finally get it right is when the celebration comes. Mm -hmm. And the celebration is Messiah ruling over his people, setting up his kingdom. 
So another way of looking at biblical zeal, it's his people, which it's Jacob, which is northern kingdom, southern kingdom. But when he's fully redeemed his people, they're called zeal. And this event culminates with Messiah marrying and dwelling with his bride. So biblically his bride is named Zion or Jerusalem. So biblical Zion is the unity of the people, Zion or the bride of Yeshua, who inherit and believe the covenant promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They follow the Torah of Yeshua by his spirit. And that is the goal of the objective, mm -hmm. biblical zeal. This is where the Father is seeking to take us in our journey. For this to be. And so, in his plan, it's outlined that it would come about through a period of 7,000 years of time. And the thought is that the seven days of creation is a prophecy of 7,000 years of time. The seventh day of creation, the day of rest, is a prophecy of the thousand year messianic era, day of rest. We see the principle in Psalm 90, verse 4. A thousand years are as but yesterday. So here, a thousand years is likened to a day. Psalm 90, verse 4 is quoted in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, when it says, Beloved, be not ignorant that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So he's saying, don't be ignorant, don't be ignorant that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. In Isaiah 58, verse 13, the seventh day Sabbath is called the day of the Lord. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath the holy of the Lord. The Sabbath, my holy day. The Sabbath, the holy of the Lord. The Sabbath is the day of the Lord. In 2 Peter 3, verse 8, quoting from Psalm 90, verse 4, one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So he says, don't be ignorant that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So after he tells you not to be ignorant of that association, then he says in verse 10, but the day of the Lord. So how long is the day of the Lord? A thousand years. He mm -hmm. says, don't be ignorant that one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day, but the day of the Lord. Yeah. So the day of the Lord is a thousand years, and so who's the Lord? Yeshua. It's Yeshua. And how long is his day? A thousand years. We call it a messianic era. But he says the day comes in the night. Mm -hmm. The day comes as a thief in the night. The day comes or starts in the night. So actually then, in describing tribulation events, it's describing is happening and associated with the day of the Lord. So the... The events of the tribulation begin the Messianic era. It's the darkness part of the day of the Lord. It says in Isaiah 13, 6, How for the day of the Lord is at hand. It comes as destruction. The day of the Lord comes as destruction. It will be as pains and sorrows, tribulation. Zephaniah 1, 14 and 15. The great day of the Lord is near, and the mighty man will cry there bitterly. That day, the day of the Lord, is a day of wrath and trouble. It's a day of distress, of desolation, of darkness and gloominess. It comes as darkness. Now, a term for the day of the Lord or uh, the tribulation period, it's associated with Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30, verse 6, it says, um, A woman being in travail, tribulation, and it says, alas, for that day is great. That day, it's Jacob's trouble. So Jacob's trouble is a part of the day of the Lord. Now, in the day of the Lord, we're told that the land of Israel will be delighted, will be divided, 
Joel chapter 1, verse 15, it says, The day of the Lord is at hand. Speaking of the time reference of the day of the Lord, it says in Joel 3, 2, I will gather all nations because they've parted or divided my land. The dividing of the land, the prophecy, is a prophecy associated with the day of the Lord. Next. Now, Zechariah 14, verse 1 says, The day of the Lord comes. Now, speaking of the same time reference, the day of the Lord, it says in Zechariah 14, 2, that the nations uh, will be gathered against Jerusalem, and half the city goes into captivity. In the day of the Lord, half the city goes into captivity. That's the dividing of the city. What's the application? East Jerusalem is designated to be a capital of a Palestinian state. It's divided in the day of the Lord. So, once this event takes place, it says, then the Lord will go forth and fight against the nations. The dividing of the land and the dividing of Jerusalem brings the judgment of the nations. And then it says, he will fight against the nations as in the day of battle. You know what's understood to be the day of battle? It's when Pharaoh and his army drowned in the Red Sea. That was the day of battle. So he's going to fight against the nations like he fought against Pharaoh. And so, during Jacob's trouble, as we have a judgment upon the nations, it says in Jeremiah 30, verse 11, I am with you, says the Lord, to save you, speaking of Jacob. Though I make a full end of all nations, though I judge the nations where I've scattered you, I will not make a full end of you. I'm going to correct you, and I won't leave you all together unpunished, but I'm not going to make a full end of you. Isaiah 34, verse 2 and verse 8. The indignation of the Lord is upon the nations. Why? Why is he upset with the nations? It says in verse 8, it's the time of his vengeance. So the time of his vengeance in the year of recompenses over the controversy of Zion. So there's going to be a controversy regarding Zion. If there's going to be, since the land is a part of the definition of Zion, there's going to be a controversy over the land. Since Jerusalem is Zion, there's going to be a controversy over Jerusalem. And it's over that controversy it brings about his vengeance when he judges the nations. And it's in the day of the Lord when we have the fall of Babylon. Isaiah 13, the burden of Babylon, the day of the Lord is at hand. In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms. So if this is a prophecy about an entity that's getting destroyed in the day of the Lord... Who would be the glory of kingdoms and regarded as the glory of kingdoms? At least in our generation, it's, it's most often seen as the United States of America. And Babylon, the glory, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Destruction. Israel and Judah re will return to the land of Israel during Jacob's trouble. So in speaking about Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7, as being that day is great, the day of the Lord, it says in verse 3, Israel and Judah will return to the land that I gave their fathers and they will possess it. So during Jacob's trouble, Israel and Judah will return to the land. And this is restoring health. Jeremiah 30 verse 7, I will restore health unto you and I will heal you of your wound. Because they called you an outcast, saying, This is Zion, which no man seeks after. Now, Psalm 102, verse 16. When the Lord builds up Zion. Well, in the Bible, Zion and Jerusalem are synonymous terms. They're one and the same. So when it says the Lord builds up Zion, I can also say when the, when the Lord builds up Jerusalem. Psalm 147, verse 2 says when the Lord builds up Jerusalem. So what is the building up of Zion? It's the building up of Jerusalem. What's the building up of Jerusalem? He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. So we can say, when the Lord gathers the outcasts of Israel, that's unite northern kingdom and southern kingdom, when he unites the twelve tribes of Israel, he will appear in his glory. Yes. Let's summarize the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is associated with the tribulation period. In the day of the Lord, 
the land of Israel gets divided and Jerusalem gets divided. The application is the nations wanting to recognize a Palestinian state on 67 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital. This is going to be resulting in the judgment of the nations and their judgment is for afflicting Israel. It, as a part of the judgment of the nations, it will be, we will see the fall of Babylon. Now, Babylon is spiritual, financial, and it's a land. So we're going to see a judgment upon spiritual Babylon, financial Babylon, the land of Babylon. And as these things are happening, that's when Ephraim and Judah return to the land of Israel, ending the exile. And so, um, these events and things associated with them is called the, con the controversy of Zion. What is the controversy of Zion? It's a controversy over the people of Yahweh who endeavor to follow the Torah. In, in following the Torah, they believe that the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is to be given as an eternal inheritance. And it's prophesied that the Messiah will fight for Zion. So, what is the controversy of Zion about? Well, it's an end time conflict between Jacob and Esau. What are they fighting over? They're fighting over who is the legitimate firstborn and who is the one who legitimately receives the blessing and the inheritance of being firstborn. In Genesis 17 verse 8, it was told to Abraham, I will give your seed the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. Now regarding the land, it says in Leviticus chapter 25 verse 23, the land shall not be sold or given away forever. The land is mine. You're just stewards of it. Mm -hmm. Don't sell the land. And Ezekiel 35 is a prophecy unto Esau. It says, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir. O Mount Seir, I'm against you. Who's Mount Seir? Next. In Genesis 36, 8, Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. So this is a prophecy against Esau, Mount Seir. It goes on to say, Because you've had a perpetual hatred... And you've shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword. Well, who's shedding the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword? Islam. Now, the book of Obadiah is written as a prophecy and a judgment against Esau. And it says in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 10, For the violence against your brother Jacob, shame will cover you. And the word for violence... In Hebrew is Hamas, for the Hamas against you. So within Islam, the primary battle they're fighting is against Hamas. In the art scroll up to Ezekiel, page 547, in Ezekiel chapter 35, he goes on to say, when the whole world rejoices, I will make you desolate. When the whole world rejoices, I'm going to make you Esau desolate. And the art scroll says, when all the world rejoices, is a reference to Messianic times. So, Ezekiel chapter 35 is a prophecy regarding Esau at the end of days. Messianic times. And now, when we go into Ezekiel 36, 1 and 2, it says, Son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, You mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. What's the mountains of Israel? Because this is a prophecy to the mountains of Israel. The mountains of Israel, biblically, is Judea and Samaria. And it extends into Jerusalem. So this is a prophecy to the West Bank and Jerusalem. And the prophecy is this, that the enemy is going to say against you, that the ancient high places is ours. The prophecy 
is that the enemy, who is defined in Ezekiel 35 as Esau, that Esau is going to say that the mountains of Israel belongs to him. He goes on to say in Ezekiel 36, 5, Thus says the Lord, In the fire of my jealousy, I've spoken against the heathen, that's the nations, I've spoken against the nations, and against Idumea, or Esau. Because Idumea is the Latin form of Esau. I'm speaking against the nations and against Esau, who has appointed my land for their possession. So, this has a multiple application. The Palestinians want the land to be a state to fulfill their national aspirations. The nations want there to be a Palestinian state because the United Nations General Assembly voted November the 29th, 1947 that the solution to the conflict in the region is a two-state solution. The nations want there to be a two-state solution because they want the land for their possession, for their objective, and in, in their solution that they stated through the United Nations. The Palestinians want it to be for their own and to fulfill their national aspirations. Now it says in Obadiah 1.18, The house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, the house of Esau for a stubble. So, the house of Joseph becomes a flame in the conflict, and from the flame of the house of Joseph, Esau becomes stubble. Esau is defeated. In the Art Scroll of Genesis on page 1314, it explains that Joseph is needed in order to defeat Esau. And the, the explanation is when Rachel gave birth to Joseph, who is regarded as the adversary of Esau, now quoting from Obadiah 1.18, it says, um, Only with the birth of Joseph, who is like a flame, could Jacob hope to defeat Esau. In the art scroll of Ezekiel, it says, according to Baba Basra 123b, Rachel's descendants are the implacable antagonists of Esau. Joseph is to be the flame which will consume the straw, which is Esau. Israel, meaning Judah, never won a victory over Esau unless its army contained contingents from Joseph's family. There is no resolution of the conflict until Joseph and Judah unite. So in Joel chapter 1 verse 15, in the day of the Lord, Joel 3, 2, the nations will divide the land. Zechariah 14, 1, in the day of the Lord, into verse 2, they divide Jerusalem. Half the city goes into captivity. And this process in our time was formally started that the United Nations General Assembly on November the 29th, 1947 voted to partition the Middle East. And they designated that there be a two-state solution. A Jewish state and an Arab state. And they designated that Jerusalem be an international city. Now that vote of November the 29th, 1947 was to be implemented at the termination of the British mandate over the area and the end of the British mandate and the beginning of that vote taking effect was designated to be May the 14th, 1948. That is why on that date David Ben-Gurion declared the, the state of Israel because it was accepting the UN vote. In essence, making a covenant with the United Nations. So part of the plan was UN Resolution 181 and this stated that Jerusalem would be an international city. Isaiah 28 
verses 14 through 16 says, You scornful men that rule this people in Jerusalem. Why are they scornful? They won't believe the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because you're saying, we could make a covenant with death. That is agreeing to a Palestinian state. That is agreeing to a peace process. So, in contrast to the rulers of Jerusalem that's making a covenant with death, the Lord's saying, I'm laying in Zion a foundation, a stone. Mm -hmm. In contrast to what you're doing, I have something that I'm doing in Zion. From the dividing of Jerusalem, it will cause the judgment of the nations. Zechariah 14.3, the Lord will fight against the nations as he fought in the day of battle. <clears throat> and so part of the judgment upon the nations for dividing the land, chemical, biological, yes, even nuclear warfare. Mm -hmm. Zechariah 14.12, this will be the plague where the Lord will smite all the people that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will consume away while they stand upon their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in their holes. Their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. That's the judgment for dividing the land. Now in Zechariah 12, 2, it says, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. This word cup is the Hebrew word saf, which can also be translated as threshold. Jerusalem is a threshold. In other words, when you cross the threshold of the God of Israel... Um, you are challenging him. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem is his threshold. And this here is the Hebrew letter Shin. And in writing the letter, if the dot is placed above the letter, it's pronounced a Sheen. If the dot is on the left side of the letter, it's pronounced sin. It has two forms. Now, here I'm showing you an aerial photograph of Jerusalem. And on this side of Jerusalem is the Kidron Valley. And on the left side is the Hinon Valley. And what goes through Jerusalem is the Tyropian Valley. So there's three valleys that physically make up a part of Jerusalem. And so in the, in the topography of Jerusalem, looking at it from an aerial photograph, it makes the Hebrew letter Shin. And you see where the temple is? Mm. It's the place where you would put the dot. Mm. And so in 2 Kings 21 verse 4, the Lord said in Jerusalem, I put my name. He stamped his name there. So, in the, and so Jerusalem is his threshold. So when the nations come against Jerusalem and they say they're going to divide the city and he's placed his name there, his name is his covenant sign. It's going to create a fight against the God of Israel. Amen. And so this is the point in time when the challenge is made, when the judgment um, of the nations comes about from them wanting to divide Jerusalem, it says in Joel 3.14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Notice the valley of decision is mentioned twice. Mm. And if you look at the word in Hebrew, it is harutz. And this word can mean a threshing instrument. And so Jerusalem is his threshold, and you thresh with a threshing instrument. Mm -hmm. But the word in Hebrew not only means a threshing instrument, but it can also mean a strict decision. So what's being said here is once this event happens, or as this event is happening, the God of Israel is requiring all nations of the earth to make a decision about what they think about it. Mm -hmm. And he's requiring in every individual on the earth to declare their decision on what they think about it. Because depending upon your decision regarding the issue, he's going to judge you. Mm -hmm. And so all the nations of the world have now voted and made their decision. 
On November the 29th, 2012, at the UN General Assembly, the issue got brought up. All nations have now voted, but it has now, but has not been ratified at the UN Security Council. Once that is done, now the the the, the, the nations have made their vote, and now God's going to require each individual to make their decision as well. And the and the decision is. Do you, are you with or against? Are you with or opposed the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because depending upon your decision, he's going to make a distinction between those who serve him and those who don't. Those who choose the covenant and those who don't. So it's believing the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob becomes the comfort of Zion. Isaiah 51.1 Hearken to me, you that follow after righteousness. Look unto Abraham. What does it mean to look to Abraham? It means believe the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when you believe the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord will comfort Zion. The comfort is believing the covenant promise. Yes. Isaiah 40 verse 1 says, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 51 verse 3, The Lord will comfort Zion. Now what is the comfort of Zion? The comfort of Zion is the end of the exile. It says in Jeremiah 31 verse 13, I will turn their mourning, yes. that's exile, into joy. That's end of the exile. And I will comfort them. We can see this in Jeremiah 31, verse 10. He that scattered Israel will gather him. He that scattered will gather. They will sing in Zion. He will comfort them. He that scattered will gather. They will sing. He will comfort them. The comfort is the end of the exile, but the comfort comes by believing the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we can see here again that comfort is the end of the exile. Jeremiah 31, verse 10. He that scattered Israel will gather him. Verse 13, I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them. And then in verse 15, Rachel is, is told to quit weeping. She's weeping in verse 15. In verse 16, she's told to quit weeping. And the reason why she's told to quit weeping is in verse 17, she's told there's hope that your children will come to their own border. So only when her children come to their own border does she, can she stop weeping. Isaiah 40, verse 1, Comfort ye my people. Isaiah 40, verse 3, The voice of him that cries in the wilderness. Yes. Well, we see from, for example, um, the New Testament that as it relates to the ministry of Yochanan the Baptist, Yochanan the Immerser, that he was called the voice of one that cries in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So it's the voice that cries in the wilderness, says, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. The Lord will come with a strong hand and arm. His work is before him. What's his work? His work is to end the exile. And he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the, the lambs. So his work is to gather the, the lambs. The work of the Messiah is to gather the exile. And that's the comfort of his people because they're no longer in exile. The Elijah message is the preparation for the end of the exile of the 12 tribes. So in 1 Kings 18, verse 30, it says, Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Now, the Hebrew word for repaired is rapha, which means to heal. So you can read it, Elijah healed the altar. Well, how did he heal the altar? By returning proper worship to the altar. And so this returning proper worship is an indication of calling the people of God to return to the Torah. That's, that's one element of Elijah's message. And the second one is Elijah took 12 stones according to the tribes of the sons of Jacob. Mm -hmm. So one is to call to repair the altar, return to the Torah. The second is Elijah's taking 12 stones. 
And what's the meaning of taking the 12 stones? It's, it's the call to prepare for the end of the exile. So in the book, The Messiah Text, by Raphael Patai, page 144, and this is a book of a collection of things that are said about the Messiah from Orthodox Jewish sources. He says and explains the following. Everywhere in the Bible, the name Jacob in the Hebrew is spelled without the letter Vav. So every time you see Jacob in the Bible, it is spelled without the Hebrew letter Vav. Except for five places where his name is spelled with the Vav. Now, everywhere in the Bible, the name Elijah, which is Eliyahu, everywhere you find it in the Bible, it's spelled with a Vav. Except for five places, it's not spelled with a Vav. Why? This is the explanation. To teach you that Elijah will come and redeem the seed of Jacob. Jacob took the Vav from the name of Elijah as a pledge that Elijah would have come and Elijah would announce the redemption. Elijah would announce the end of the exile to his children. The nations are judged for dividing the land of Israel on the day of the Lord. Joel 1.15, Joel 3.2. And in judging the nations, there's a controversy over Zion. And in judging the nations, it's called Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7. And in judging the nations, Jacob will be judged, but Jacob will be delivered. Now, in judging the nations, there's a specific highlighted judgment that comes in the judgment of the nations and it comes to Babylon, or the end time spiritual land of Babylon, which I believe is the United States of America. And so in the prophecy against Babylon in Isaiah 13, it says the Medes will be against them. Who are the Medes? It's the Iranians. Jeremiah 51 verse 1, I will raise up against Babylon a destroying wind. The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes the Iranians, because they want to destroy Babylon. In Jeremiah 51.1, those that come against Babylon, it says in verse 28, prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes. So it's not just Iran, there's those who are in alliance with her. Jeremiah 51.1, I will raise against Babylon a destroying wind, and they will empty her land, for in the day of trouble they will be against her. Now this is a prophecy of the tribulation period. That during the tribulation period, kings, in, along with the Medes, will be against Babylon. So I will raise up against Babylon a destroying wind, the spirit of the kings of the Medes, who wants to destroy Babylon. It's the vengeance of the Lord. Now the vengeance of the Lord is over the controversy of Zion. So putting two and two together, Babylon is doing something to Zion that's causing the vengeance of the Lord against it. It's advocating the dividing of the land. Isaiah 13.1, it says the burden of Babylon, pains and sorrows will take hold upon them. They will be in pain. So this judgment is during the tribulation period. The judgment is over the dividing of the land. Isaiah 13, 1, the burden of Babylon. Verse 6, the day of the Lord is at hand. Verse 9, the day of the Lord comes. So it's a prophecy of the tribulation period of the day of the Lord. And it says in Jeremiah 50, verse 16, cut off the sower from Babylon and him that handles the sickle in the time of harvest. Babylon is being destroyed in the time of harvest. And when's the time of harvest? Matthew 13, 39. It's the end of the ages. And cut off the sower. What does it mean, cut off the sower? The sower is the one that sows the word, that, that, that God's word is going forth from Babylon. It's going to be cut off 
because of the judgment in the land. So the instruction to God's people who's living there in Jeremiah 51 verse 45 is go out of the midst of her. Leave. Flee. And then it says in Jeremiah 50 verse 16, for fear of the oppressing sword, they will flee everyone to his own land. And then the instruction to his people is, you that escape the sword, let Jerusalem come to your mind. Flee and go to the land. Jeremiah 50 verse 4. In those days and at that time, says the Lord, the children of Israel will come, they and the children of Judah. So Israel and Judah are living in Babylon when it's being judged in the day of the Lord and Jacob's trouble in the time of harvest. And they're seeking the Lord their God. Who are they seeking? The Messiah. And they're asking the way to Zion. Why are they asking? Because they don't know. What is the way to Zion? Zion is, believe the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, return to the land, follow the Torah of Yeshua by his Ruach, and to declare him Savior and Lord and King of Israel. That's the way to Zion. So, the event surrounding all these things is called the controversy of Zion. Now, in the conflict, it says in Joel 3, 6, the children of Judah have you sold that you might re remove them from their border. So, a process is that the children of Judah and the children of Jerusalem, Jews who are living in Judah, Judea, Samaria, and in Jerusalem are going to be kicked out of their homes. But they're being kicked out of their homes because they're regarded as being the problem. Outcasts. I will restore health unto you and I will heal you of your wound because they called you an outcast. Now if we look at this in Hebrew, it says they called you an outcast. They called is the Hebrew word kara. And kara means to approach in a challenging or an aggressive way. And outcast is nadak, which means to drive out. So here's the word picture. When they approach you in a challenging and aggressive way and, said, and say, you need to leave your homes, that's when I'm going to redeem you. And so there's going to be a conflict, Zechariah 9, verse 13, that Judah and Ephraim, the sons of Zion, will be opposing the sons of Greece. The sons of Zion will be against the sons of Greece. So in what way will there be a manifestation of the sons of Zion opposing the sons of Greece? When the sons of Greece want to recognize a Palestinian state based upon 67 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital, the sons of Zion will rebel. They won't accept it. And in their rebellion, they will declare that which the nations want to recognize as a Palestinian state. They will declare it for the God of Israel on behalf of the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They will declare it to be a biblical state, which Isaiah 66 verse 8 calls Zion. And once you see this event, it means redemption is coming. The end of the exile is coming. Because when you see this, Isaiah 66, 14, your heart will rejoice. Your bones will flourish like an herb. And the hand of the Lord will be known to his servants, his indignation toward his enemies. Now, in the associated meaning and relationship of the Hebrew word, Zion, in the family associated meaning, it means a sign. Isaiah 66, 8, it says, as soon as Zion travailed. So, Zion, in the Strong's Concordance, is the Strong's number 6726. And you can see in the definition of the Strong's, it says Zion is the same in Hebrew as the Strong's number 6725. And 6725 
is z own. So if you look at z own and z own, they have the exact same Hebrew letters. The only difference is the vowel pronunciations. So in the original biblical text, there aren't any vowels. So when we uh, see the word, does the word mean a sign or does the word mean zeal? We don't know unless we look at the context, the words around it. So when it, in Jeremiah 31, 15, Rachel was weeping for her children. And who specifically is being referenced regarding Rachel's children that she's weeping for? Verse 20, she's weeping for Ephraim. And then it says, the prophecy is, don't weep because your children will come to their own border. So Rachel's told she's going to be comforted because her children, Ephraim, will come to their own border. And regarding Ephraim coming to his own border, it says, set you up Zion. I could read this, set you up a sign. Mm -hmm. So the sign of the end of the exile, the sign that Ephraim or Joseph is returning home, the sign is the setting up of Zion. The Declaration of the Independent State. And this is what is prophesied in Revelation 12. There appeared a great sign in heaven. I could Hebraically render that there appeared a great zeon in heaven. So the sign is a woman that has a crown and 12 stars. That's the sign. What's the woman in the who has a crown and 12 stars, that's Zeal. That's the 12 tribes of Israel. With a crown, ruling and reigning. When do they rule and reign? In the kingdom. So now we're given a sign that Israel's going to rule over the nations. And, and so with this sign, it says the sun and the moon are under her feet. The sun is a reference to Greco-Roman Christianity, which has been associated with sun worship. The moon is Islam. The sign of Islam is moon. So in other words, once we have the end of the exile and Israel ruling over the nations, once Messiah sets up his kingdom, there is no, Gre there is no more Greco-Roman Christianity. There is no more Islam. Her enemies are defeated. The conflict is resolved. And it says, She being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. So, the bringing about of the end of the exile comes through travail and pain. So Revelation 12, 2 is a reference to Isaiah 66, verse 8. Now, we need to understand the context of the book of Revelation. Revelation 1, 9, John, who was given this vision, he's writing down the vision of what he's seeing, and he's saying about the vision in Revelation 1, 10, I was in the Spirit, I'm seeing something in the Spirit, and what I'm seeing in the Spirit, I'm in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. What's the Lord's Day? The Day of the Lord. The prophetic Day of the Lord. He's being shown events that are happening in the prophetic Day of the Lord. And what did we see from Isaiah and Jeremiah that's happening in the Day of the Lord? The end of the exile. So he's being shown details of events that's happening in the Day of the Lord. So, once we have the sign, I mean, the prophecy that Israel's, going, Israel's exile is going to end, and she's going to rule over the nations, that we're given the sign that that's going to be, but the process of getting there is, once we see the sign, that she's to flee into the wilderness for 1,260 days, and when she flees, she's given two wings of a great eagle. She's given two wings of a great eagle. Well, this is synonymous with what is said of the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. It says in Exodus 19.4, You've seen what I've done to the Egyptians. I bear you on eagle's wings. So as he brought them out, he said that he is bringing them out. When they left Egypt, on their way to the promised land, they went through the wilderness. So, on our way to 
on the way of Israel ruling over the nations, the process to get there is to go into the wilderness. The prophecy then in Revelation 12 verse 5 is she, that's the woman, it's got the crown and the 12 stars, that's Zion, that's the end of the exile, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations. And in ruling all nations, it says in Revelation 19, verse 15, he will, he will rule with a rod of iron. And, and this is a reference to Isaiah 66, 7, that when Zion brought forth, she delivered a man-child. The man-child is the Messiah. So what's being explained is from this event, she brought forth the child. In other words, the Messiah gets revealed to his people that he is the Messiah from this event. She's birthing the Messiah, meaning she's birthing the understanding of who the Messiah is. And who she's birthing is going to rule all nations. So from her birth, she delivers a man-child. Now, in Psalm 87, verse 5, it says, Of Zion it said, of Zion it says, this is the prophecy about Zion, this and that man was born in her. This and that man was born in her. So the prophecy about Zion is a man is being born in her. In other words, the revelation of the Messiah comes about from the birth of Zion. The child that, that Zion births is the understanding of the Messiah. The child that Zion births is the end of the exile, the uniting of Ephraim and Judah. In Isaiah 66, 8, that this nation that's given birth to the man-child, it says the nation is born in one day as soon as she travailed. So it's a nation that's being established during the tribulation period. And as soon as she's established, she brings forth her children. She brings forth the understanding and the revelation of who the Messiah is and we have the end of the exile. Now, here we have a key principle regarding the issue. Micah 5.2, it says, Bethlehem Ephratah, out of you will come forth one is to be a ruler of Israel, whose goings forth has been from all from everlasting. Who's that? That's the Messiah. It's a prophecy that Messiah will come out of Bethlehem Ephratah. So regarding the Messiah, it's said of the Messiah, he will give them up. Now, what does it mean he will give them up? Well, it means he'll, he will hide his face. He will hide his face. He will give them up until, he's not going to give them up forever, until the time which she which travails brings forth. What's that? That's biblical Zion. He will give them up until Zion is born. Then the remnant of his brethren will return to the children of Israel. He will give them up. He will hide his face until Zion is born, and then the, the exiles are going to be gathered. Psalm 102, verse 13. You will arise and have mercy upon Zion. When the Lord builds up Zion, when he builds up Zion, he appears in his glory. So, when he gathers and unites the twelve tribes of Israel, he will appear in his glory. Psalm 147, verse 2, the building up of Jerusalem is gathering the outcasts of Israel. And the gathering of the outcasts of Israel is gathering the twelve tribes of Israel. Isaiah 11, verse 2, he will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah. With that background, you should be able to understand what Paul is explaining in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Yeshua and by our gathering together unto Him. So, His coming is associated with us gathering unto Him. His coming is us gathering unto Him. So, what's that referring to? The gathering? It's the uniting of the twelve tribes of Israel, which is called the Day of Messiah. So, in the Day of Messiah, the Day of the Lord, in the Day of the Lord, 
the Messiah is going to gather the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, without the background that I've explained to you, you read those verses without the background through a different set of theological eyes, and how do you read that verse? Well, that's the pre-tribulation rapture. Yeah. <laughs> but wrong set of gla eyeglasses. Remember, Isaiah 5.3, He will give them up until... So here in Isaiah chapter 8 verse 14 it says he will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both houses of Israel. That's the Messiah. He's the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. Verse 17, I will wait upon the Lord that hides his face from the house of Jacob and I will look for him. Who's the one that his people is looking for and waiting for? The Messiah. And so it's said of the Messiah that he's hiding his face. But he's only got to hide his face until she which delivers brings forth. Now verse 18, Behold, I am and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel. From the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Who dwells in Mount Zion? Psalm 2.6 I set my king on Mount Zion. So Yeshua dwells in Mount Zion. He's hiding his face from the house of Jacob until she which travails is bring forth. And once that happens, the Lord will roar out of Zion. He, he roars out of Zion. He's waiting for Zion, and then he roars. <coughs> Let's summarize this part. The nations will divide the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem by creating a Palestinian state. Dividing the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem will bring about the judgment of the nations. And as a part of the judgment of the nations, there's a judgment upon an end-time spiritual land of Babylon, which I believe is the United States, who will be destroyed. The judgment for dividing Jerusalem is nuclear warfare. And the tribulation period is known as the Day of the Lord. The tribulation period is known as Jacob's trouble because it's a conflict between Jacob and Esau regarding to whom the land of Israel belongs. And the conflict between Jacob and Esau regarding to whom the land of Israel belongs is known as the controversy of Zion. Judah, the Jews, in the land cannot defeat Esau until Judah unites with Joseph, meaning the ten tribes of Ephraim. Jerusalem is a threshold. The covenant that Yeshua made with Abraham is a threshold. If you embrace the covenant, you will be comforted. Otherwise, you will be judged. The United States will be destroyed for dividing the city of Jerusalem. Jews in Israel will forcibly be removed from their homes during the tribulation period. Those who believe the covenant that Yeshua made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be regarded as outcasts. And biblical Zion will be born during the tribulation. It is an independent state in the West Bank. It will come about from Jews in Israel who embrace the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're the governors of Judah from Zechariah 12. And they will reject and rebel against the nations who want to see a Palestinian state on 67 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital. When biblical Zion is declared, that's the independent state in the West Bank, it will begin the process of ending the exile of the twelve tribes. Biblical Zion burst Yeshua revealing himself to his people, meaning bringing forth the man-child. When he ends the exile of the twelve tribes of Israel, Jacob is born in Zion. In other words, they give their hearts to Yeshua. This and that man was born in her. The people are born into the Messiah. They give their hearts to the Messiah. When Yeshua ends the exile, Joseph, or the ten tribes of Ephraim and Judah, will unite during the three and a half years of the Great Tribulation period. And when Yeshua gathers the exiles of Israel, he roars out of Zion. Now, okay, you want a break? This is, this is the end of the summer. Let's take a break then. <sighs> My head's <laughs> No, I can't take more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll go put pedal on. So let's pause.